for another episode of The Dr. Cliff Show. My name's Cliff Olson. Just kidding. I'm Rachel Cook, Doctor of Audiology at Applied Hearing Solutions, and I am joined with my co-host. My name is Kelsey Beck, and I am the Audiology Resident at Applied Hearing Solutions, and I gotta say I was not ready for this. Thank you very much. I just got really confused. Like, what are you reading? What? That's not in the script. That's not As you'll probably notice, Dr. Olson is not present with us today. He is joining the AAA American Academy of Audiology Conference in Seattle, Washington. Mm -hmm. So you're stuck with the two of us today. All in good fun, though. So uh, we have a great lineup for everybody today. So we're going to talk about earwax and at-home removal. So we're going to talk about what the heck is earwax, how was it created, why do we have it. Um, we're also going to talk about some problems that it can create if you have too much earwax um, and then we're also going to talk about how you can remove it at home both the good and the bad versions of at home wax removal oh yeah so just a very brief trigger warning uh that some of the images that are going to be shown today are kind of gross uh, so just be aware and if gross things are not your thing uh you might want to look away every now and again um, but don't forget to also submit your questions for our live Q&A at the end of the show. And again, if they are pertaining to at-home earwax removal, they are more likely to be answered live on the show. Most definitely. Now, before we get into all of this fun stuff, we have got to talk about our first sponsor here, which is the Santro Sound Wave Hearing. These are OTC hearing aids here. You can see them here. We... Sorry, I'm, I'm missing actually something on my screen over here. Kelsey, do you have internet connection? My whole thing just went down on me. Oh, I do have an internet connection. Oh, perfect. So I'm going to go ahead and talk Thank about Santro hearing aids here. So at this point, I'm sure that you have heard that over-the-counter hearing aids have been approved since October of last year. Um, and so the Santro uh, is a receiver in the canal design, and it is intended for adults who have a perceived mild to moderate hearing loss. It utilizes their Ototune smartphone app, which allows you to test your hearing and uses artificial intelligence to customize your initial programming. The app will also allow you to make self programming programming adjustments to your Santro OTC hearing aids to help you optimize their performance. Um, these adjustments include different programs, an equalizer, noise reduction, feedback cancellation that you can adjust from the comfort of your own home right on your smartphone. Not only that, but you also get a one month free of auditory training from Amptify, which is a digital hearing health program that will help your brain to process auditory information better. Personally, I'm a huge fan of auditory training. It is one of the easiest ways to uh, improve your performance in your, with your hearing aids, especially in a background noise situation. So if you'd like to have more information about the Soundwave Santra OTC hearing aids, go to hearsoundwave.com or you can also find them on hearingup.com. Thank you for that. My internet is now back and functioning. All right, so we're gonna be jumping straight on in. And the first thing that we need to talk about is just how is earwax created overall? So um, nearly everybody has earwax. It's very normal to have in, in more um, reserved quantities, right? We're gonna mm -hmm. talk about what happens when earwax accumulation gets a little bit out of control. Mm -hmm. um, but it is created in the outer third portion of the ear canal. So we actually have a graphic for this as well that's got some of the anatomy there. So you can see on the far left side, that is your outer ear. And as you can see going into the ear canal, that entire length of the ear canal covers um, I mean, nearly a couple of inches, at least an inch and a half, but that outer third part there, that is where you can see that earwax starting to accumulate. It doesn't really accumulate much deeper in the bonier portions of the ear canal. It's really more where there's tissue that acts a lot more like the skin that we have everywhere else on the rest of our body. Absolutely. And, here, and earwax does actually serve a purpose. And again, in moderate quantities. So mm -hmm. it's it's designed to lubricate and moisturize the ear canal. It also has a lot of antimicrobial properties to keep out infections. And, you know, I've also seen uh, some people who argue that like it keeps little buggies out of your ears yeah. and things like that as well, because it is not, it is a very hospitable home. But we have to have something that's inside of our ears that is designed to work its way out of our ears to get all of that dirt and little buggies out of our ears. Right. It's basically like a self-cleaning mechanism for Absolutely. your ears. Absolutely. Exactly. Much. Yeah, so there's different kinds of earwax, and we see, obviously, a lot of earwax in the clinic. And 
it is very personal and it can even be different between your ears so you could have one type of earwax in one ear and a completely different type of earwax in the other ear but we've got a couple of graphics so again if you are squeamish or um, uh, if you do not want to lose your lunch or anything like that we are going <laughs> to jump straight into pictures of some earwax here and so the first one that we've got a graphic of is some sticky earwax and so we see this in the clinic pretty often mm -hmm. especially individuals that might wear hearing aids with ear molds that could trap in a little bit of extra moisture in the ear mm -hmm. that moisture can really cause more of a stickier consistency yeah absolutely and you make a very excellent point about like that moisture and humidity and so your environment yeah. also plays a really big role so like out here in Arizona we are a very dry climate it is hot we off I honestly see more flaky earwax which is actually something more dry and we have a graphic of that as well um, and so you can see that that is probably something that I see more often yeah. out here because you not only have you know the earwax itself being created but you also have some dry and flaky skin that is mixed into there as well um, and so that is often the appearance that we see here all right now I completely agree we do see that a lot and then we also end up seeing some harder more impacted wax and we have a graphic of this as well now when we say the word impacted what we mean by that is that it is packed down into the ear mm -hmm. and we will also use the term occluding which just means that it's covering the ear canal entirely to the point that we cannot see past the blockage and that type of impaction right there is going to lead to some definite temporary hearing loss until that wax is removed. Absolutely and something to note here as well is you can see how it sort of has you know indentations mm -hmm. into it and how it's even deeper into that ear canal than that image would have led us to believe the anatomy image of where earwax is actually formed. Right. This is a pretty telltale sign that someone has been putting something into their ear whether it's a cotton swab or something to, of that nature in order to try to get it out on their own and honestly it has just shoved it back deep into the canal and has created that hard impaction and honestly and the darkness of the color as well indicates to us that it has been there for quite a while for a very long time mm -hmm, absolutely now I get the question all of the time which is well how is earwax supposed to even get out of there how mm -hmm. does it get out of there and the truth is is that it normally migrates out of the ear canal naturally the actually the lining the skin lining in your ear canal is kind of set up like a spiral and over time as it sheds it starts to migrate out of the ear naturally but it also migrates out with talking and with chewing so your jaw does hook into the bottom portion of your ear canal and every time you talk the bottom of your ear canal does move slightly mm -hmm. and that movement does help that wax migrate out of the ear even further this does definitely depend on the anatomy of your own ear canals though so for example my right ear canal is a pretty straightforward ear canal we have the normal bends that you see mm -hmm. most of the time but my left ear has an extremely sharp bend which means that as that wax is trying to migrate out of the ear canal it might be hitting a wall when it's trying to do so absolutely and so again you know and every ear is different just like you mentioned so one of your, one of your ears is you know more straight or rather the more natural contouring or not natural but the more usual mm -hmm. contouring yeah um, whereas the other one if you've got something that's a little bit different going on in your ear it might not be able to escape as well I even see this with people who have extremely small ear canals mm -hmm. where you might not be producing more wax than someone who doesn't have very small ear canals it just has less space yeah, and so it creates space. a problem sooner than it would for somebody who doesn't and have such a small ear canal as well right now a couple of other factors as well age can play a pretty big role so a lot of people do tend to produce more earwax the older they get a lot of children also produce earwax a lot mm -hmm. and most most young adults in in midlife don't tend to have as much earwax accumulation but it totally depends on the person and it really really depends on your genetics and I wanted to take this moment to talk about how I got a 23 and me health test done Did, do they do earwax they talk genetics? about the consistency of the earwax that you could wow. have and it was spot on and so a lot of different ethnicities have certain types of earwax consistencies right. and most um, fairer European descendants tend to have stickier earwax than other ethnicities huh. and it was it was describing my earwax and I was like okay this is a little too personal now like it, you, it's an you, odd you picked thing. my eye color you picked my hair color you picked my ideal wake-up time in the morning which was also what? spot on and then it was telling me about my earwax and I was like okay this I had no idea 23andMe did something like that yeah oh, so like if you I, get the health report done 
Cool. Yeah. I, might, I might have to do that. That'll be really interesting. All right. Well, let me know what your wax consistency you end I'll let, up with. I'll, I'll let you know. Um, and if it lines up. I'll let you know for sure. Um, so, and again, the overproduction of earwax or even the habitual of putting things into your ears mm -hmm. in order to try to clean it out can cause a lot of other issues as well. First being impactions, which we saw. Um, a lot of ear itching can be associated with a lot of earwax as well. Again, hearing loss if you do have that impaction. And this is not something that, again, is permanent. This is something that there's a blockage in your ear it's blocking sound from being able to get into your ear vibrate your eardrum and so therefore it creates a hearing loss um, you also can have a lot of clogged hearing aids which we see all of the time where mm -hmm. I, I have a joke uh, amongst my family it's like man I just live my life in earwax because I see a lot of people for earwax removal very frequently and yeah. I also clean their hearing aids at the same time and the majority of what I'm cleaning off is the part that goes into their ear, covered in some earwax, clogs it up. It can even actually block off all of the sound from even getting out of your ear, or I'm sorry, out of your hearing aid and into your ear as well. Yeah, in fact, that would be the most common <laughs> report of concerns that we have in the clinic is, help, my hearing aid stopped working, and 9.9 .9 times out of 10, it is a clogged wax guard on the end of that receiver. So mm -hmm. definitely something that we see in the office Quite frequently. Now, in the office, we also do a lot of professional removal, and we are happy to remove it professionally for you in office. And next week, we will be covering all of the ways that we do remove earwax in the office. However, we are just as happy to have you remove this earwax at home so long as you are doing it safely. So we are going to talk today about good earwax removal methods and bad earwax removal methods. So... So today we're actually going to start with the good earwax removal methods because we want to start off on a strong note here. So the first thing that you can do is always, is even get something that, like a video otoscope. They have them on Amazon. We have a picture later on coming up about what they look like. So keep that in mind. But it does help you to visualize what is actually going on inside your ear. And do you even need to remove any of your earwax? And again, some earwax is normal. And so you and it does provide a lot of antimicrobial um, things as well. So earwax in the ear is good now if you have too much of it that's what you're looking for and a lot of the time after that after you visualize and you've confirmed that you do need to actually remove some earwax one of the biggest uh, at-home methods is actually using some sort of an earwax softener. Um, things like Debrox is very uh, popular. Um, there are a lot of other over-the-counter products as well. The one that we actually use in the clinic is called Earwax MD, and actually the company Eosera that makes uh, Earwax MD is actually one of our sponsors as well. But that's not exactly why we're talking about nope. them in this segment. It is actually because we do use their product in the office. We do recommend it at home for use as well, and we actually have a really cool video of just how it breaks down earwax wax as opposed to another you know over-the-counter product that does exist out there yeah let's watch this so basically that's the earwax MD over on the right hand side and then it's leading competitor over on the left hand side and over time you can see in the upper left hand corner it's showing kind of this time progression but you can tell that that earwax MD is just breaking that mm -hmm. down and again like she said this is not a sponsored podcast episode in that yes eosera is one of our podcast sponsors but they we, we didn't tell them that we were doing this or talking about mm -hmm. this today we're showing you because it is highly highly effective and it's one of the only products that we can trust in the clinic to break that wax down effectively so that we can then go in and either flush it out or mm -hmm. suction it out from there especially to especially with the and the first impacted uh, photo that we had actually looked very wet and almost sticky mm -hmm. even though that the wax itself was very hard and that's because we had just used earwax md on it to soften it up so that we could actually get you know our irrigation in there to be able to pull it out safely and without causing any pain or discomfort as well right. so yeah. You make a good point that you can't just use, and a lot of people have this misconception, oh, I'll just use an over-the-counter softener type of a drop, and, and that'll be enough, and that's mm -hmm. where I'll just stop. And again, if you have a lot of jaw movement from talking and chewing, and that wax is broken down enough to migrate out on its own, that's great. That's very rare mm -hmm. that that's happening. And so we need to soften it up, but then we have to flush it out. Exactly. And that is where a lot of people, I hear that, you know, I, I use Debrox or I use these drops 
and I used them for 15 days in a row and I still can't hear. And it's like, well, that wax that's in your ear may very well be super soft and ready to go, but it needs that little push at exactly. the end. Exactly. And so the Earwax MD kits actually do come with a bulb syringe. So, you know, we do have a picture of a bulb syringe here as well. And you just fill it with water. You want to make sure that it is body temperature water. Um, if it's too hot or too cold, it can make you dizzy. So just be something to be aware of. But you want to actually flush that ear out after using something like Earwax MD or a D-Rox or whatever other over-the-counter um, product you are using because you do have to still stimulate that wax to actually come out of the ear canal. Otherwise, you are just making it kind of a sticky, soft mess in there. Right, right. A lot of people will even think that they have an earwax impaction because they can feel it and they're bothered by the discomfort of it, mm -hmm. but they can still hear and then they use those drops and it softens everything up and then they're like, oh, now I really can't hear mm -hmm. because everything is soft and liquidy in there and, and, and that's great because it's broken down, but it's still in there. So you got to go in and flush it out. Now, sometimes we do have some ear canals that may not even have wax in there necessarily. Mm -hmm. It may have some other types of things in there, such as like fungal overgrowth. Mm -hmm. um, and I will be very clear with this, that if you have a, a considerable amount of fungal overgrowth in your ear, there's nothing you can do at home that's going to remedy that entirely. That is going to require some sort of physician mm -hmm. um, taking a look at that and prescribing some sort of treatment for that. Um, but there are some people that just are more susceptible to fungal overgrowth in mm -hmm. their ears than others. And that is where we would likely want to do a, a mixture of not only body temperature water, but also some distilled white vinegar. Mm -hmm. There are some properties in distilled white vinegar that can really help with um, breaking down wax for mm -hmm. sure and helping with the fungal overgrowth in the ear too. Absolutely. And, and you know, not to be squeamish, we do have a, a uh -huh. picture in here as well. And so again, you know, if you, if you have bought one of those video otoscopes and this is what you see at home, our first recommendation, uh, always hands down, is that you go and see your physician, PCP, urgent care, something to have someone look inside this, make sure that there's not anything more sinister going on or that they needs to be treated medically, that it's treated medically. Um, and on top of that, if you are someone who has been seen regularly, know that this is something that you can do preventatively, um, then yes, that 50-50 you know, uh, split between that warm uh, bo uh, body temperature water and the distilled white vinegar is something that you can do at home. But again, Make sure that it still has been evaluated at least the first time that you find it. Yes. I like to say that a lot of these methods are really preventative. So let's say you go into the doctor, they mm -hmm. see a bunch of earwax, they remove it, and now you got a clean slate, mm -hmm. right? That's when these removal methods are really highly effective using something like the earwax MD drops once a week or even once a month to break down any wax that could be accumulating in there. Flushing the ears out once a week, not a bad idea mm -hmm. as just part of at home routine kind of maintenance of your ear canals. Mm -hmm. um, because those things are going to keep it from accumulating to the point of needing to see a professional to get it all removed again. So Absolutely. great ways to keep it out of there. Now, mm -hmm. if you have a complete and total impaction you might have a hard time getting that out at home because we even have hard times getting that out in the office sometimes. Oh yeah, but I mean, I think we've spent like at least an hour with a couple people trying to get oh, stuff yeah. out. Um, and then the other thing too is that the bulb syringe is great. There are other products that exist as well. Um, there's like the Wax Blaster MD. It's essentially kind of like a spray bottle that you use inside your mm -hmm. ear to kind of really, sh uh, you know, get around the uh, outside corners of the ear canal to really fl uh, separate that earwax from the ear canal. Um, and again, shower water even too, yep. part of your regular shower process just put a little bit of that shower water let it run through your ears that pressure will also help to break up and to remove some earwax out of your ears as well right now if you are prone to that fungal overgrowth that we were talking about earlier then moisture is not going to be your best friend and using shower water or water overall probably would not be the best option to be doing on a preventative basis but for other individuals who have mild to moderate amounts of earwax and just want to make sure that their ears are clean and clear i do recommend just letting some water run in there in the shower let it kind of fill up sit in there for a second kind of flip do the other side mm -hmm. um that 
you know, body temperature water really helps to just keep things cleared out on, on a more, uh, you know, proactive, preventative basis. Absolutely. And so let's jump really quickly into our next sponsor segment here, which is actually from uh, Eosera and Earwax MD. And I thought it was very appropriate to talk about <laughs> Earwax MD just a little bit more. Um, so again, we all know that if we have an over uh, an overdoing rather of earwax or debris inside of our ears, we want to make sure that we use something to soften it up, break it up. Um, so Earwax MD does use sodium and potassium bicarbonate to go ahead and break down that wax, the glycolic acid to exfoliate dead skin cells from the ear canals, and then also glycerin to help hydrate the ear canals as well um, and allows that earwax to slide right out when you do go ahead and flush it with that bulb syringe. It's at about 10 to 15 drops in each of your ears. Let it sit for 10 to 15 minutes and then go ahead and flush that out. Um, you can get that at eosara.com, CVS, Walgreens. Um, it's available for purchase as well um, in you know most real, uh, retailers as well. Yeah, great. All right, let's get into the fun stuff here. We got to talk about bad at-home removal methods because boy, are there a lot of them. And unfortunately, we see it in clinic all of the time. Mm -hmm. um, we got we to gotta talk about the elephant in the room here. Cotton swabs. Yep, cotton, cotton swabs. swabs. It's everyone's favorite tool to remove earwax at home, and it is the worst possible tool for you to be removing earwax at home. So yeah. let's jump into why, shall we? This is really a moment where if you get squeamish at all in any capacity, we're really going for it today. So if this is not your type of thing that you like to see, I would recommend you avert your eyes and just listen to this part. Yes. So the first thing that we want to talk about is perforations. Um, we did show this graphic last week as well uh, when we talked about our clogged ears episode. And yes, the uh, I believe that the story was this person's dogs had run into the um, room as they were, you know, very comfortably utilizing their cotton swabs at home, went right on through that eardrum, c caused an immense amount of trauma and pain. Um, the other thing that we also see as well is leftover remnants of cotton swabs inside of ears. Um, we have that graphic for you here as well. You can see that the cotton, the tip of that cotton swab had actually come off almost completely from the cotton swab and it is just lodged inside that ear. Definitely something that we need to remove professionally after that. Um, I did see a comment somewhere um, that, you know, you could just grab some tweezers and pull that sucker out. Uh, please do not do that. Um, that is one of the best ways to really cause some damage and trauma to the ear canal along with that q-tip and so this next photo is actually again if you're squeamish don't don't tune in for this image but there's a lot of trauma that was caused just by the q-tip not oh. even someone trying to clean them out with cotton with a uh, cute uh tweezers or anything that is just from uh, cotton swab trauma there man um, that's a brutal one oof and that is a brutal one that's going to require surgical reconstruction yeah. is what that's going to require and i've yeah. seen it because i worked at an ent office and i have seen traumas uh perforations that are this traumatic that required one to two sometimes even three rounds of surgery and even mm -hmm. then their hearing post-surgery is never really the same yeah so there is a saying that don't put anything bigger than your elbow inside of your ears um and i stand by that we mean it unless it's us uh, well but the, here's the, <laughs> but, that, but there's a really good point in that is that someone who's doing it professionally likely has a much better view than you do so when i remove your wax i always have our um our uh, scope on so yeah. that it has magnification i have good depth perception and i can see exactly what i'm doing in a very controlled environment i am bracing as i'm doing this as well so i'm not just free floating into your ears so that if there is you know a sudden movement or something like that from somebody that i'm removing wax from I'm not going to accidentally cause any trauma because I've taken all of the necessary safety precautions. Right. Exactly that. So now, let's talk about this medieval torture tool, <laughs> uh, this corkscrew tool thing that we've got going on, too. We've got a graphic of this tool. Oh. Something like that. I don't know who was involved in the development of a product like this. Mm -hmm. um, this is another thing that I do not want seeing going into anybody's ears. Uh yeah, and I know that it's technically designed so that you can't stick it very far inside your ears where it is going to stop you at a certain point. What I will also say is that I have seen a number of differently sized ear canals uh, to where that would actually fit in a lot of our patients' ear canals yeah. where you could get it pretty deep in there. Yeah. Not to mention you also just risk the scratching of the sides of the canals and to cause that amount of trauma to then also, again, be open to infection if you're not, you know, maintaining that device properly and you don't have the, you know, the sanitation uh, of that that you have the capabilities of doing at home. 
Oof. You know, I, you bring uh, up such a good point that um, we don't even have in here to talk about, but earlier when we were talking about the fact that in the ear canal you know one of the reasons that we have earwax overall is this lubrication and moisturization of the ear canals and it's like this you know we've got this thin layer of oil all over our bodies mm -hmm. on our scalps on our skin and it's really important for keeping the skin intact the way mm -hmm. that it needs to be and when you're going in with q-tips or you're going in with that whatever that corkscrew tool thing was you're consistently wiping that protective mm -hmm. material off of your skin and that can either cause your skin to create more of that oil so now you're actually creating more wax by trying to remove it in the first place or you're just removing that barrier overall and causing a lot of itchiness dryness and discomfort I can't tell you how many individuals I see in the clinic that go I can't get my ears to stop itching I can't I can't I can't and mm -hmm. then I ask about cotton swab use and they're like oh yeah every single day multiple times a day and I'm like well you're wiping off all of the protective material that stops your ear from itching in the first place mm -hmm. so just leave it alone yeah it's almost like um, so I don't know how many people are like hair care gurus and things like that, but anytime that you're using an abrasive material on your hair or on your skin, the exfoliating nature of that is not great for your ears because it needs to have that protection, that protective lining. It's why, you know, things like lotions exist and all that because we do so many damaging things with the type of materials that we wear. Um, they're very drying to the skin. Same thing with cotton swabs in the ear canal. Right. Now, let's take a second to talk about ear candling. Oh, my goodness. In fact, I think that this is one of the biggest videos that Dr. Olson has on his channel is, is debunking the effectiveness of ear candling. And it is probably the most popular at-home earwax <sighs> removal method right now, and it terrifies me. Now, so scary. Now, and again, I don't, and I don't say that as just an audiologist. I say this as a person in general who is maybe not the most coordinated of human beings as well, but... The only image that I can get in my mind is someone, again, just like that do those dogs running in with the Q-tip, is that one wrong move and, like, you're lighting your hair on fire. Like, oh, like seriously. Even outside of the ear canal and what the damage could potentially be to the ear canal, you could set fire to something. Oh, yeah. We're talking burns. We're talking... Um, you know, external outer ear canal infections. If you're causing any sort of abrasions or getting any foreign material in your ear, um, yeah, wax dripping down into your ear canal and getting mm -hmm. into your ear or even onto your eardrum. I mean, I, I don't even want to know the people that have gone on to seriously injure themselves trying to do this. And watch Dr. Olson's video on this. You will mm -hmm. find out that they do nothing, mm -hmm. nothing at all other than being very unsafe and very good at their marketing tactics. Mm -hmm. Well, and here's the thing too, is that it does put a, quite a bit of heat into your ear, which is the point. And, and, you know, and I get the theories behind it all as well, um, that it is trying to come and get out of your ear because by using the heat and all of the things that it's designed to do. However, the thing that I've actually seen the most is that it actually ends up melting the earwax. And it actually, even if you don't even get like whatever the debris is from the candle itself into your ear canal, melts the earwax and the earwax is the thing that ends up getting uh adhered to the eardrum oh, gosh. and so then you're you know going into your into the office and you're like man like you don't have that much earwax but it's all adhered Stuck to, to the eardrum. eardrum and that is really hard to get out it's really not very comfortable it's pretty painful in fact um and it causes a substantial hearing loss because it is quite literally not allowing that eardrum to move even though the amount of earwax you had in your ear to begin with was probably pretty easy to remove or to even just let migrate out on its own. Yep. Yep. I think for, for the cost of an office visit to just have it done by a professional, it's probably not a bad idea. Or you start with one of the removal methods that we talked about earlier. Exactly. Um, there's a picture right there of what that looks like. And that just looks so safe. We're backed up right to some extremely flammable materials right behind their head. Um, this is just, just don't, just don't. Please. That's all I can say. Just don't. To me, this is sort of on the eating Tide Pods. Uh, <laughs> oh, gosh. Okay, yeah. This is something that we're just not going to do. Yeah. Okay, we're just not going to do. Now, um, earlier we were talking about the um, video otoscopes, right? Mm -hmm. And we were saying that that's actually a good idea for you to be able to look into your own ear to see if you have a blockage or if you have an impaction. And for our patients that do experience impactions quite frequently, we do recommend this to them. And there are several tools that you can get um, in in-person retailers and online retailers, 
such as Mm -hmm. Amazon that do give you the ability to visualize in your own ear canal, but they also give you tools. Yes. They Let's talk you, about the tools. They give you tools. And we have a we have a photo here as well of just kind of what we're talking about for uh, some visual reference. They have this camera that you can see goes and it, you have you're able to see the tool that you're working with. Um, and there's quite a huge blind spot right in there where you really can't see past the tool. You don't really know what you're doing. And yes, it does it does tend to have these like sur- these uh, silicone uh, covers on them so that they don't you know quote unquote damage your ear canal. However, I have seen trauma with just with something like this. Mm-hmm. I have also seen people like, oh no, I lost the ceramic ear tip. Well, the tool will still work without it. I've seen that for sure. Um, and so it's really hard to know th- what you're doing with them. And we actually do have a video of yeah, something look, like this, this actually that we tried in office. And so this video that we're showing, this is actually our video otoscope that we use to you know visualize the ear canal. And then we actually had a uh, you know, a patient. This is Heather. Uh, she's been a vid- she. This is a YouTube video. She consented to be in with Dr. Olson, Dr. Cliff as well, and you can see that she's using that tool on her own, trying to get out the earwax, which is what it was essentially designed for. And she's having the hardest time. She's also a registered nurse, and so she is familiar with the anatomy of the ear canal. And still, she's having one heck of a time even visualizing. And then so Dr. Olson stepped in, and he was like, okay, well, maybe I can do it as a trained professional. And his view really isn't much better. The lack of depth perception was the biggest piece here. It's like you don't really know how far you're going in. You don't really know if you're quite around the wax that you want to get out. And so then here's the other thing is that when you can't do it yourself, you often ask a friend to come and do it. And mm-hmm. so that's what we did. So Chris uh, used to work in our office as well. And so she's untrained. And so she tried to do it. And look at what happens right here. She actually pushes all of that wax deeper into the canal because she's really not having a good time with using that. And so, again, these sound like a much better and much safer idea because, yeah, you have visualization. You can see what you're doing but it still is not a great idea because you don't know you don't have great depth perception with these types of devices they're they're really more looking as a video camera and they're not really designed with a lot of depth perception or ease of use for this purpose and so we do not recommend using them we see far more often that people end up hurting themselves pushing that wax deeper and creating more of an impaction it's almost kind of akin to just a q-tip you can still see with but it still doesn't have the same effectiveness as getting it professionally removed. Most definitely. So I'd say stick to it from a visual perspective more than anything. Don't don't go digging in there. We don't need to be mining for anything in your ear canals. No, yeah. Definitely not. Now, a pretty common one that I hear of very often is the use of peroxide mm-hmm. in the ear canals. Um, you know, I'm going to give this one like a... Like a three out of 10 rating. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, it bubbles a lot in the ears. And so a lot of people find that to be kind of a placebo effect and like, oh, I heard it breaking up the material. Mm -hmm. Um, it, it, It is reactive with the material in your ear. We have just found that it's not actually that effective in its use. And not only that, it is definitely known to not only irritate skin, but also dehydrate the lining of your ear canals as well, causing even further irritation. Mm-hmm. So, and, and there are, uh, you know, over the counter products that are used and that are, that are very, that work very well that have peroxide as an yeah. ingredient. Yeah. And when combined with some of these other ingredients that are also designed to then rehydrate the ear canal that have other properties that will also go ahead and help to break down the earwax as well, it can be very effective, but just putting the peroxide in on its own is not going to be effective not to mention um i mean i don't know if you've ever put on peroxide on just a regular cut or dry skin it can also sometimes even burn yeah Uh, when you're utilizing it it can also if you do have any uh you know perforations in your eardrum that you're unaware of because you haven't had your ears looked at by you know by a professional because again just because you have this sensation of earwax and clogged ears doesn't always mean that you actually have earwax. And so if you're concerned about that, also go ahead and check out our podcast from last week where we talked about all of the different things that can actually cause that clogged Clogged earwaxy sensation. Um, But if you have a perforation in that eardrum, like the Q-tip one, or, you know, maybe a little bit less so, I mean, you can really do some damage inside the middle ear space. You can cause burning and pain. I mean, you really don't want to go and put it into your ear. No, definitely not. I mean, when we're talking about all of these, we're talking about preventative at-home methods. Is it our first choice? 
Likely not. Not until we have confirmed that your eardrum is intact, mm-hmm. um, because, like you just said, that's a that's a pretty big deal. We sh- we should not be introducing anything, any sort of foreign material or um, anything that could get into the middle ear space that could cause further infections. Or you know, we're really just looking out for your safety more than anything. I know individuals really want us to have this one size fits all solution for them, the way to manage their earwax at home, um, and there are good ways to do it but there are just steps that are needed before you do those things to Mm -hmm. make sure that you're doing it safely and effectively for sure exactly now we have also heard some really incredibly weird odd and off the wall things that people have tried to clean out their ears with so i think i told this story last week but i'll tell it again just in case you missed it Uh, my favorite end all be all story about people putting things into their ears to clean them out was actually like the head of a rusty nail um And I get the thought process. I mean, it has essentially a hook um, to, you know, potentially scrape out whatever you're getting. But he scraped a little bit too hard. And his ear canal actually ended up swelling up, had tetanus from it. It really wasn't a great, uh, uh, was not a great situation. And unfortunately, I don't actually know the outcome of that because uh, he became an ENT patient. It was no longer my patient after that. But uh, it was very. It was not a. It was not a great looking ear ear canal, and it really did cause quite a bit of pain. It caused a hearing loss, and he just thought that, oh man, maybe I just have an earwax infection. Uh, you know, this does really hurt. This causing a lot of pressure, and it turned out to be a wholly other. Uh, situation in his ear oh goodness gracious that sounds pretty consistent with my story that i experienced as well where i looked in a patient's ear canal and i went wow this is red this is vascularized this is angry this is agitated there Mm -hmm. are abrasions i see a bunch of just dead skin and like you could see like the veins kind of running through the ear canal and i'm like what is going on here and i asked this individual you know what are you uh, is is this just an infection? When did this start? You know, I'm all concerned. Mm-hmm. And they said, oh, well, you know, I thought that I was getting a lot of buildup in my ear. And so I just poured some bleach in there. And um, yeah, it really, really hurt. And it stung a lot. But I just suffered through it because I was hoping it was really breaking everything down in there. And I was like, yeah, your skin and your eardrum and everything that you need to be able to hear effectively Um yeah, yeah. Um, oh my, he had done my, it a couple like, of times. Hurts. And I said, listen, bleach is for like toilets. Mm-hmm. Bleach can be for, for showers, you know, you materials that are. Clothes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You can throw it in your, your load of whites. Um, your <laughs> ear on your body, that is going to be an absolute no go from me. Oh, man. Well. Um, in any case, if you have any other questions that are building up at home, much like some earwax can, <laughs> tends to do, so no, no pun intended when I initially said it, but in any case, if, don't forget to submit your questions um, either on the YouTube Live or if you're watching on Facebook or WTSM TV, we want to make sure that we get your questions answered. And again, if they are about at-home earwax removal or even professional earwax removal, we will more, be more likely to answer them live in our Q&A coming up. Right. So now one thing that we know for sure is that earwax can, can really impact your hearing aid performance. And this can happen by either clogging up your ears causing temporary hearing loss or by clogging up your devices causing them to need either in-office maintenance or even potentially repairs if that wax really works its way down into the receiver uh, essentially breaking it and needing a manufacturer repair so for this reason it is extremely important that you see a provider that you can trust to manage your hearing health care that can not only service your devices if something goes wrong but they can also help you keep your ears free and clear of wax professionally like what we will be talking about next week. So this is exactly why Dr. Olson created the Hearing Up Network. This network is a group of vetted providers that follow comprehensive best practices to get to get you and to keep you hearing your best. And I would wager that, you know, uh, wax removal and keeping those ears clear of wax and keeping those devices clear of wax would be a component of comprehensive best practices in keeping up with the proactive maintenance and care of your hearing and of your devices. So next week, we'll be talking about that professional earwax removal. But if you're ready to see the results for yourself, you know you have an earwax impaction and you don't want to wait any longer or struggle with any of the at-home removal methods, then definitely head to hearingup.com to find a best practice provider near you and to get scheduled for your own ear cleaning appointment. All right, I think you've got some warnings for us. I do have some warnings, and again, the warnings are pretty much what we've said throughout, so I'll go through them pretty quickly. Um, I want to make sure that, you know, if you 
you know it's not always earwax that causes that plugged up sensation so again if you have any questions about those please go back to last week's episode we talk all about it and if you are concerned if you uh, then you want to make sure that you do go and find a hearing care provider because if there isn't any wax if there isn't a perforation if there isn't any pain either associated with it it might not even be a blockage of any kind you might just need a hearing test and you might have some hearing loss as well. And so we want to make sure that you are seen by someone who, again, follows best practices. So hearingup.com is a great resource. Um, but you want to also just make sure that if you're going to do it at home, you're going to do it safely. I still recommend that you at least have somebody look inside of your ears or if you can look inside of your ears at the very least before you start putting stuff in your ears. That way we actually know what's going on before we start uh, trying to do any of these at-home methodologies. Most definitely. Okay. All right. Question I think, time. I think we're moving into some questions. So um, about halfway through the live stream on Facebook, I lost it. Okay. Uh, I, I have not been able to get back into it. But YouTube does look like it's up and running, and we've had quite a good amount of activity on this episode. So um, I'm just going to read through some of these now. It's very difficult to read them and host at the same time. Uh, we do definitely try our best, but it is nice when there's three of us here so that mm -hmm. one can be off to the side monitoring and interacting with y'all. I know there were some questions in here of you know are they even reading this or are they in here um, on the days where there's three of us absolutely on the days where there's two of us we are trying our best yes. so and um, here's the bear thing with too, us is here that when there is only two of us we are still going to read through questions at the end we just will have a little bit less engagement while the show is actually running but uh, the first one that I'm seeing here that I'd really like to take a stab at is uh, if you wet your q-tip but you don't go in that deep, just like maximum one centimeter, is that okay? You know, I do use cotton swabs on the outer portion of my ear. I do agree that there are little crevices and folds and things that need cleaning, and there are a lot of, uh, there are not a lot of tools on the market that are as perfectly designed as a cotton swab to get into all of these little folds and things. So I always tell people, if you're gonna be using a cotton swab on your ear, that's fine in your ear, proceed with caution. I actually have a story of an individual who was in the outer portion of their ear, right? Going very delicately, not going into their ear, being very controlled with their movements. And um, their dog ran in the room and jumped on them. It and as their the dog, dogs. I know, it's literally always the dog. Actually, I've heard this story twice. So again, working in an ENT office, we see all sorts of things. Um, once it was the dog and once it was that um, their spouse had come home and yelled, you know, honey, while they were doing it and it startled them. But regardless, in both of those instances, boom, straight through because they were startled and, mm -hmm. and, and they, you know, reacted. And that reaction was it sent that cotton swab right through their eardrum. Mm -hmm. So, you know, even if you think you're being careful, even if you're like, I know how deep to go and how deep not to go, things still happen. Things still happen, and I think that's a really good point because, again, we're not following you home. We cannot expressly tell you do not do that. I mean, we're, we can advocate all we want. If you want to choose to put cotton swabs in your ears, that is your choice. We will not stop you. We will also just tell you that it is not an uncommon thing for it to go wrong. So do with that information what you will. We don't recommend it. If you're going to use it just again on that outside portion in a very controlled setting, you know, if your dogs are locked up, your husband's locked up, whoever is locked up, uh, just make sure that there isn't something that could potentially cause harm to you there. Most definitely. Now, whoever game account is, they've been very active on this episode and I very much appreciate it. It's, I mean, all sorts of contributions to the conversation. And um, one of the things that they said, there's actually a few of them I kind of want to touch on, but one of them they said is about the video camera. And they said, but if you're using it without anything, just to look inside of your ear, it's not a bad idea. I have one and I sometimes check my earwax amount so that I can book an appointment or start to soften it. And I'm like, yeah, booyah, that that's exactly perfect. That's exactly what we want to so see. So you're using the tool to visualize your outer ear canal to see if you have a buildup. And if you do, you can absolutely start the process of softening that wax before your scheduled appointment so that when you go in the removal is much less uncomfortable much less painless I mean a lot of times when we're removing wax in office it's not painful by any means no but if you have that really hard really built up really impacted earwax 
that can be uncomfortable to get out. So this is the perfect example of how to properly use an at-home video otoscope tool uh, in the way that we would like for you to be using it. Not necessarily to go in there and dig around, just to use it as a tool to know when to seek professional help and when to get started with at-home kind of removal or softening methods. Exactly. Um, this is a really great question from Hellhound 15 times. Sorry if I'm butchering whatever the intent of your name was, um, I do apologize, but they said any at-home kits that utilize the suction method like some offices use. Now I have seen some suction methods for at-home use. I will also say that I have yet to see one that I actually genuinely think works well. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think that too is why there's probably really not one in our episode that we really touched on today because if we had found something that really worked and you know we've you know we've tested a lot of different things in our office we've had you know Dr. Cliff of course tests a lot of different products at home as well and I really just have not found anything that uses suction that honestly is really worth writing home about to even no. really comment on it being you know even a dangerous method because I don't find that they actually work to begin with where people are actually purchasing them. No, no. Um, I, I have one word answer for that, and the answer is no. Um, speaking of that, we also have a question from WTSM TV. So we Let's have do it. Doug Franz from Doug Franz Unplugged on WTSM TV in the mornings wonders if you can use the end of toenail clippers. No, you cannot. Please don't. Please do not put the end of toenail clippers anywhere near your ear canals, sir. Now I also get, so a lot of the end of ear toenail clippers, they do have, again, the little hook there. Yeah. And I get that the idea is that, yeah, it's probably pretty effective up until the point that it goes through your eardrum and, ooh, mmm. Yeah. Ow. Yeah. Not a great idea. Doug Franz, by the way. Sorry, I pronounced that wrong. Doug Franz. But, um, Doug, I'm going to say it's a hard no from me. Uh, again, anything smaller than your elbow, sticking it in your ear, it's probably just not a good idea. Let's just keep it out of there and, um, you know, let leave it up to the professionals or you use some sort of at-home irrigation as well. It's probably going to be your best bet. Mm-hmm. Oh. I know I'm looking through this I'm as looking, well. Yeah, we're looking through it to try there, to find some uh, questions. There was an interesting one that I saw, um, someone who said, you know, I don't even have to worry about this because I got a cochlear implant. And oh it's actually, I mean, it actually is kind of true to a point, right? So accumulated earwax can still cause itchiness, pain, pressure. You know, I have had people who have come in who say, I can still hear um, but man, it's uncomfortable in there and I can feel it kind of pushing on the canal. So mm -hmm. you do have to worry about it up into a point. Mm -hmm. However, you are on the right track if you do have a cochlear implant and we're not worried about doing any sort of external transmission of acoustic, mm -hmm. um, you know, sounds, then yeah, you lucked out on that front. We're not worried about it ruining your devices or anything like that. Yeah, for sure. I actually, so, uh, and I'm, you know, my fiance has a, a hearing loss in one ear as well. And I, I mean, he's, and he has had a complete hearing loss in that way year since he was born um, and I looked inside his ears when we first started dating and we found quite a bit inside that ear that can't hear and we ended up having to go through a lot of the removal yeah. processes um, and I, I mean I did it at home and again I used all of the out the only the at-home ones that we actually talked about in the front so earwax MD again is one of my best friends at home too um, because we also found out that he does produce quite a bit of earwax um, but he was completely occluded in that ear and he just never noticed because he has not had hearing in that he ear his know. entire life. Yep. So <laughs> can definitely happen. Yeah. Oh man, talk about a horror story. I'm reading this comment from Barbara who said, I used to clean out my ears with peroxide until the night I poured some in and nearly passed out from the pain. Oh Ended up in the ER. Six months later, I had my eardrum grafted back on. So it burned her ear. Oh. Yeah. So here's oh. the thing. Your eardrum is 0 0.1 millimeters thick. That is about the same thickness as a single strand of hair, which means it doesn't take much. Mm -hmm. It doesn't take much. And if there was any sort of abrasion, opening, scarring, anything on that eardrum that I would consider to be kind of a more non-standard anatomy, that can be that peroxide can totally react with that mm -hmm. and and just bore its own hole 
you just really go for it. So, uh, yeah, I agree. There, there are risks to all of these, mm-hmm. to all of these methods that we're talking about. And you just, you've got to be, you got to be careful. Mm-hmm. You got to be, be careful. careful. And if you're, I'm sorry, if you're even unsure, even a little bit, seek help or like just seek care from at least at the very least like an urgent care your pcp your local audiologist we are happy to look inside your ears i even told somebody today that getting into audiology my most unexpected favorite part of my job is actually removing earwax so there are people out here who do love it um i find it is very gratifying and satisfying so uh if you would like earwax removed uh join us next week too for our professional earwax removal discussion uh because that is in the works as well so we will be back next week too with everybody uh, doing professional earwax removal. Uh, yes. So, and I also want to just point that um, we will be, after next week's episode of doing professional earwax removal, we will actually be beginning a six week series um, in combination with Natus on all of the technology that we use in our office, all of the diagnostic testing equipment. We go into talking about our ear scanners, our real ear verification equipment, and how that Um, top-of-the-line technology in combination with best practices can lead you to hear your absolute best. So definitely do not miss any part of that series. Just know that it is going to stretch on for quite a while. Like I said, we are going deep, deep into the weeds on the tech side of things and how that tech helps us help you hear your best and do your best. So we've got a lot of fun things coming up here shortly and just make sure you stay tuned for all the fun. Yeah, and you can find us next week uh, live on the podcast at 4 o'clock Arizona time on Facebook Live, YouTube Live, and WTSMTV.com, and we will see you next time. 